Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're talking about an industry that has come up quite a few times before, supplements. Herbalife is probably the best example I've talked about so far that illustrates how dangerous these products and how unregulated they can be. Largely, vitamins and supplements aren't regulated by the FDA, so they don't undergo rigorous safety testing. While that might be good for a company that's trying to produce them, they are obviously not what's best for consumers. But before we get into all the nitty gritty details about how this industry has been negligent and downright harmful, let's get into the history of why the supplement industry is barely regulated in the first place. Let's get into it. The NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, brings us all the way back to the 1800s when this first began. Herbs and botanicals have obviously been used longer than supplements as ancient cultures employed them medicinally. People have long used plants and other substances to supplement their diets in an attempt to prevent or ameliorate specific symptoms. There's nothing wrong with that and certain supplements are prescribed by doctors and they do have some research behind them, though we will get into that later. The problem, in my opinion, starts in 1906. You see, in 1906, the Federal Food and Drugs Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act were the earliest comprehensive efforts by the US government to bring greater emphasis on both to the safety of marketed products and to the accurate characterization of the benefits derived from their use. It established a broad authority, a way for the government to protect the public. However, when more specific laws came along, supplements were left by the wayside. In 1938, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act replaced the 1906 law, which had become obsolete by that time. More food standards were introduced and drug manufacturers had to submit their products to the FDA before release to prove that they were safe. However, the original 1938 act contains no specific provisions for vitamin, mineral, or botanical products, except for section 403, which indicates that a food is misbranded if it claims to be for special dietary uses, but its label does not bear FDA prescribed statements about its vitamin, mineral, or other dietary properties, sufficient to inform the consumer about its value for such uses. This is when things kind of start to fall to shit, in my opinion. I know the FDA couldn't have possibly predicted how huge this industry was going to become, but supplements and the botanical industry took advantage of that lax nature. In 1944, when FDA charged that certain vitamin B capsules were misbranded as food and as drugs, the courts dismissed the food counts, holding that the capsules were drugs by definition because vitamin B was listed in the USP the official homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States. Until 1958, the FDA sounded like they were trying and failing to control this growing market. The Food Additives Amendment of 1958 stated the following. A food additive is defined by statute as any substance the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristics of any food. If such substance is not generally recognized to be safe under the conditions of its intended use. Unless the substance at issue could be considered as generally recognized as safe, grass, by the manufacturer for its intended use or had been sanctioned or approved by FDA or the US Department of Agriculture prior to 1958, manufacturers were required to obtain pre-market approval from FDA for the substance. In general, the result of the Food Additives Amendment was to shift the burden of proof of safety for new substances added to food away from FDA and to the manufacturers. While the Food Additives Amendment provides a petition process by which FDA can approve a food additive that has not been determined to be grass, manufacturers also have the option of determining for themselves that a substance is grass. The grass determination of a substance by a manufacturer must be based on generally available and accepted scientific data, information, methods, or principles, which ordinarily are published, and there must be a consensus among qualified experts about the safety of the substance for its intended use. 
if these conditions are met, manufacturers can self-affirm the gross statute of a substance. So that really doesn't help anybody. Generally recognized as safe as grass is a broad term. It's no wonder things continued to spiral out of control. It gave manufacturers the power to decide if their own product was safe. And that just sounds so wrong. Like what company would say it wasn't safe? Obviously they're going to fudge whatever numbers they have until it meets those grass requirements. So is it really any wonder that this got so out of hand? Again, I know the FDA couldn't have predicted how insane this would get with the Hunbots peddling dangerous products on every corner of the internet, but this one's kind of on them. That's why you need Herbalife for your nutrition. In the 70s, the FDA issued even more regulations that prohibited representations on supplement labels and established certain standards of identity. However, even with the suppression of FDA's attempts at more restrictive rulemaking, the realm of products sold as dietary supplements continued to expand and included botanicals and amino acids, as well as vitamin and mineral products. This expansion during the late 1970s and 1980s was accompanied by some reports of serious illnesses attributed to a few of the dietary supplements available at the time. I go back on the prolamine plan and I keep my weight down. In 1978, for example, an infant with colic was reportedly given a fatal dose of potassium chloride supplement based on erroneous advice in a parenting book, despite medical knowledge that use of such doses of the supplement would induce cardiac arrest. In 1989, there were widespread reports of some L-tryptophan supplements were associated with esophilia myalgia syndrome. Both the L-tryptophan incidents and FDA's concerns about unsubstantiated claims appearing on the label led to new attempts by FDA to regulate the industry in the 1980s. It was in 1994 when the DSHEA was passed, the Dietary Supplement and Health Education Act. This exempted dietary ingredients and dietary supplement products from being regulated under the category of food additives. It also states that a dietary supplement will be considered adulterated and illegal if it presents a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury under conditions of use recommended or suggested in labeling. Decade after decade, the FDA came out with new regulations to try and keep this market under control. The dietary supplement industry has grown enormously to the point where it's worth more than $40 billion and there's over 50,000 products on the market. The FDA may say they're cracking down on it, trying to control it, regulate it, whatever wording they choose. But to me, it sounds like they're just playing a game of catch up and the slime balls that put out unsafe products are still taking advantage of their former unconcerned attitude. Now, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of incidents over the years because of this kind of regulation. I can't go into every single possible issue, cause, or case, or we would be here for years, but we're going to go over quite a few of them and explain how proper regulation could have prevented this from happening in the first place. Dr. David Sears, who spoke with the American Council on Science and Health and is the director of medical nutrition at Columbia University Medical Center, explained in a 2014 ASCH article that, some nutrients are known to have toxicity if taken in high doses. He gives examples such as vitamin A causing brain swelling and liver failure in high doses, zinc decreasing the levels of copper in the body and vitamin E and selenium supplements may increase risk of prostate cancer. Furthermore, because these supplements are not regulated, industry is not motivated to conduct proper studies to determine their safety and efficacy as is required for prescription drugs. Yet even physicians are not aware of the lack of information on the safety of dietary supplements. Now, we know that anything can be harmful in high doses, even water, but supplements can be a lot more dangerous than you realize and a lot easier to take in excess. For example, while some sources aren't so sure about fish oil being good for your heart, others firmly stand by it. Overall, the research is a bit of a mixed bag. However, whether or not it actually works, the quality of the ingredients in these supplements is often subpar. Over 70% of fish oil supplements in a study where over 47 commercial fish, krill, and algal oil supplements were tested, didn't contain the stated label amount of EPA of DHA. This doesn't mean they're downright harmful, but it means the quality is just a lie, plain and simple. 
But there's more to this than just poor quality. Business Insider told a tragic story involving St. John's Wort, one of the most popular herbal supplements out there. They say, when Puya Jamshidi, a resident at Wheely Cornell Medical College, delivered his first baby, the doctor on call told him to take the newborn away from its mother. The baby, a healthy girl with mocha pink skin and a powerful set of lungs was being quarantined. In the middle of the pregnancy, her mother had come down with tuberculosis. She'd contracted the contagious lung infection in her teens and the illness came back despite preventative antibiotics and regular screenings. The cause, a popular herbal supplement called St. John's Wort. The trouble is most people don't understand it's a medication because you don't need a prescription for it. And so she didn't tell us, she told Business Insider. St. John's Wort is one of the most popular herbal supplements sold in the United States. But in 2000, the National Institutes of Health published a study showing that St. John's Wort could severely curb the effectiveness of several important pharmaceutical drugs including antibiotics, birth control, and antiretrovirals for infections like HIV by speeding up their breakdown in the body. It basically overmetabolized the antibiotics so they weren't in her system in the correct dose, Jemshidi said. The findings on St. John's wort prompted the US Food and Drug Administration to warn doctors about the herbal remedy, but that did little to stem public sale or consumption of it. Over the past two decades, US poison control centers have gotten about 275,000 reports, roughly one every 24 minutes, of people who reacted badly to supplements. A third of them were about herbal remedies like St. John's wort. I'm not saying that zero responsibility should fall on the consumer to understand these things and that every product out there should be made idiot proof. But if anything is going to be made idiot proof, shouldn't it be drugs and supplements? I get packets of information about my medication every time I pick up a prescription. No matter if it's birth control or heart medication or whatever it is, pharmacies give that information for a reason. Supplements don't play by these rules. If I look up St. John's wort on Amazon, the label does say to consult your doctor if you're taking medications. But when the ingredients are literally just herbs, I think it's pretty safe to say that most people won't think this little vegan liquid capsule could be harmful or could possibly undo a serious necessary prescription. But then we also have companies like Herbalife that don't seem to give a shit about what they put in their products to begin with. In case you thought Herbalife was just for weight control. And the attitude that they take is really disturbing. In 1998, one woman that took Herbalife ephedra supplements and drank their tea went into cardiac arrest and she had to be resuscitated four times. She was only 28 years old and had been perfectly healthy. And no, she hadn't been overdosing, but took the recommended daily amount on the label. Herbalife simply said that they'd never been contacted by the FDA and had an exemplary safety record. They weren't concerned, but simply denied it and genuinely seemed to ignore the problem. Eventually, this led to ephedra being banned altogether as a dangerous ingredient. Shown to be effective for weight loss. If this Herbalife supplement had been analyzed and was required to get permission in the same way that prescription medication does, Four times a day. this might've been avoidable. I'm not saying that every single prescription is perfectly safe and there's never been an issue, but at least it's far more regulated than this. And just to look at some numbers here so we can begin to really drive this point home, the FDA recalled 274 dietary supplements between January 1st, 2009 and December 31st, 2012. 74% of them were produced by US manufacturers and most alarming yet, some of these banned ingredients are still active in the supplements these researchers purchased months after the ban. So the FDA says they're dangerous, bans them, but then what, walks away, doesn't enforce the ban? I know there's an overwhelming amount of supplements on the market, but if the FDA has identified them as dangerous, it seems like the least they could do is, you know, enforce their own rules. Some Americans have wanted less FDA oversight of these supplements. And I understand that people want choice, they don't want to rely on drugs, and plenty of people go after that natural market. But without proper regulation, it's just dangerous. Healthline has a number of quotations on their website from the president of the American Academy of Family Physicians, the president and CEO of the Council for Responsible Nutrition and other medical professionals alike. 
They say that some products may not contain what the label claims, that dietary supplements have their place in promoting health, and that the standards invite misconduct and fraud and fails to adequately assure consumers. Even more mainstream news sources like CBS have come out and made online compilations of dangerous ingredients often found in supplements. They list aconite used for inflammation and joint pain and say it can also cause nausea, vomiting, low blood pressure, and heart rhythm disorders. Another, colt's foot, used for coughs and sore throats, laryngitis, bronchitis, and asthma has been linked to liver damage and cancer. Then there's country mallow, which sure sounds innocent enough and has been used to treat nasal congestion, allergies, asthma, bronchitis, and weight loss, but it can cause heart attacks, heart rhythm disturbances, and even stroke. These supplements sure sound harmless. Seriously, with a name like country mallow, who'd think it could fucking kill you? But like anything else, like any other drug really, when it's taken improperly, any kind of pill can be unsafe. I'm not trying to scare anyone here, but knowing what you're taking, sticking to the daily recommended amounts and demanding better regulation is a good place to start. Now, before we continue on to take a look at if these supplements actually work, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank today's sponsor. Now, after spending a year essentially locked into our homes, apartment and townhomes, we've definitely developed some unhealthy habits. I know I have, especially when it comes to eating. And that's why I'm so grateful for HelloFresh because they literally helped turn my kitchen around from like a fast food hell hole into a place where you can actually cook and enjoy fresh meals. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and trips to the grocery store so that you can enjoy your cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. They even have meals that are ready in less than 20 minutes with even easier prep times. And they offer over 25 recipes to choose from every single week, from vegetarian meals to craft burgers, extra special gourmet options. There's a little something for everyone to enjoy. And you can get better value too. HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant without sacrificing the quality. Now on Monday, I know that we mentioned the meatballs, but today I'm going to mention they have a one pan chicken pot pie that will blow your mind and I mean it. So if you wanna get started with HelloFresh today and try some of these amazing meals that I've been kind of mentioning here and there throughout all of these ad reads, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Again, make sure to go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. This episode is also sponsored by Jenny Kane, one of my favorite new sustainable clothing brands. Now, the cool thing about Jenny Kane is that they're focused around a California cool vibe, which means that the accessories are all really neutral and they're casual and they're very easy to mix and match, which I love because it makes getting dressed really easy. And I already told you about the boyfriend sweater in that beautiful pinky red tone color. It's called Rose, I think. And I love that because it's got the long sleeves. It's extremely comfortable. I just, it's, I could wear it every day. I could seriously live in it. But Jenny Kane also has furniture, accessories, and things for your home as well. I am patiently waiting for this chair. It's called the Brentwood chair. I want it to come back in stock. It looks so comfortable and it looks like it would fit anywhere in my house. So I am just patiently waiting for June when it restocks. But Jenny Kane has more than just really nice sweaters and really nice chairs. They have an entire clothing line. So everything from top to bottom, completely covered, including shoes. And one of my favorite things about Jenny Kane is it's simply stylish. It's classic timeless pieces that'll never go out of style. So you're investing in really really good quality items. And the other thing that's really important to me is sustainability, which is something that Jenny Kane also really believes in. They make sure to source everything within fair trade and to make sure that it's not hurting the environment with the fabrics that they choose to work with. And they also recently released a recycled fabric line too. So if you wanna try recycled clothing wear and see what that's like too, Jenny Kane has an option for you as well. So if you wanna get started today, head on over to jennykane.com and when you go to check out use code casket to get 15% off your first order. Again, that's Jenny Kane spelled J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com and use promo code casket for 15% off. So with all these risks, is it worth it? Do supplements actually do anything? And the answer for most people is no. According to News in Health, over half of Americans take dietary supplements daily, but as long as you eat a variety of healthy foods, you'll get all the nutrients you'll need. 
I know that's easier said than done, but that's really the best way to go about this. I mean, you'd think that the people buying these dietary supplements in the first place are doing it because they're health conscious. But again, if you're eating a balanced diet, then these supplements don't help and some can do more harm than good. Some scientists have fought to prove that vitamins and supplements do work, one being Nobel Prize winner, Linus Pauling. This guy was actually fucking insane and insisted that vitamin C could cure the common cold and cancer. He was famous, think of like the Dr. Oz of the 70s. So people believed him, even though there was no real evidence to back him up. But then he died of cancer in the 90s, so guess he wasn't eating enough vitamin C himself. There's even articles from the Autism Parenting Magazine out there that say vitamins will promote brain development. And yeah, don't don't get me started on that. If supplements help an autistic child with gastrointestinal symptoms, that's one thing. But if I start having to read about how supplements are going to cure autism, I might just scream. Anyway, I'm not trying to say that vitamins and supplements are 100% useless because if you are seriously deficient in certain things, yes, it might be useful. And sure, there's plenty of stories out there where people say it works for them. But I just want to point out as an aside that in many of these stories, people would start a healthy ritual of eating better, exercising, and using vitamins. Then in the end, there are vitamin enthusiasts saying how it made such a difference in their life. Like, what about the exercise and healthy diet part? If all you needed was vitamin C, why go to all the work of working out every morning? Like, it makes me think that weight loss is because of something other than vitamins, but okay. As for the scientific evidence, recent studies have shown no benefit for supplements. In 2019, the National Institute of Health's director blog posted this. Based on an analysis of survey data gathered from more than 27,000 people over a six year period, the NIH funded study found that individuals who reported taking dietary supplements had about the same risk of dying as those who got their nutrients through food. What's more, the mortality benefits associated with adequate intake of vitamin A, vitamin K, magnesium, zinc, and copper were limited to food consumption. The study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine also uncovered some evidence suggesting that certain supplements might even be harmful to health when taken in excess. For instance, people who took more than 1000 milligrams of supplemental calcium per day were more likely to die of cancer than those who didn't. The researchers led by Feng Feng Zhang, Tufts University, Boston, were intrigued that so many people take dietary supplements despite questions about their health benefits. While the overall evidence had suggested no benefits or harms, results of a limited number of studies had suggested that high doses of certain supplements could be harmful in some cases. And that is a gigantic yikes on trikes from me. More likely to die of cancer? really sounds like Linus got his research backwards. I'm not saying never eat an orange again or that vitamin C is bad for you, but this overdosing or obsession with supplements has got to stop. But can we at least agree at this point that it doesn't really help? Just to hammer the point home, I looked at a few more sources and believe me, they were not hard to find. It's not like I was searching for a needle in a haystack here. Just looking up studies about vitamins will bring you to any of these pages quite easily and they all have a pretty similar answer. Many people routinely take nutritional supplements such as vitamin D and fish oil in the hopes of staving off major killers like cancer and heart disease. But the evidence about possible benefits of the supplements has been mixed. Now, long awaited government funded research has produced some of the clearest evidence yet about the usefulness of taking supplements and the results published in two papers are mostly disappointing. Both trials were negative, said Dr. Lawrence Fine, chief of the clinical application and prevention branch of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, a part of the National Institutes of Health, which funded the studies. Overall, they showed that neither fish oil nor vitamin D actually lowered the incident of heart disease or cancer, Fine says. The trials involved nearly 26,000 healthy adults age 50 and older with no history of cancer or heart disease who took part in the vital research project. Discover Magazine also explained that brain-related supplements typically taken by seniors hoping to prevent dementia and Alzheimer's are just a downright scam. In June, 2019, a neurologist who studies brain health and prevention of dementia wrote an article for them. He said, a recent study found that a quarter of adults over 50 take a supplement for brain related health. But that same study done by experts covened by AARP suggests that seniors should spend their money elsewhere. The supplements don't work. 
This is no small issue. Expenditures on non-vitamin brain health supplements, such as minerals, herbal mixtures, nutraceuticals, or amino acids have extended into the billions of dollars. This can amount to between $20 and $60 a month for seniors, a sizable sum that could be put towards other expenses, including fresh vegetables and fruit that actually do make a difference. But there's loads more. Time Magazine said that an analysis of FDA records revealed that in a span of 10 years, about a thousand people ages 25 and younger had health issues linked to dietary supplements. This resulted in 166 hospitalizations and 22 deaths. The American Cancer Society has stated that drugs are considered unsafe until proven safe, as it should be. And with supplements, this just isn't the case. The Atlantic has detailed how hard this process is to regulate. And in the words of Kessler, a professor at UCSF, it makes regulating tobacco look easy. Thankfully, there are some steps being taken. Last year, CVS Pharmacy even did the FDA's job for them and conducted their own study about these supplements, not to see if they worked, but to be sure that what they put on their shelves met safety standards as part of their tested to be trusted program. Apparently of the 1400 products from 152 brands tested, 7% didn't meet their regulations and were pulled from the shelves. Beth Kitchen, a registered dietitian and an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham's Department of Nutrition Sciences said, "'This requirement by CVS is good news for consumers. Supplements will now have to have the approval of a third-party independent group, such as the USP. This will assure customers that the supplement has in it what it says it has in it, and it is not contaminated with potentially dangerous ingredients.'" And good job on CVS, like honestly, I just find it a little pathetic that they are doing the FDA's job. Still though, I hope more companies selling supplements follow in these footsteps, so at least the access to potentially dangerous products is lowered. Now, my point here isn't to say that all supplements are the devil and if you're taking them, you are unhealthy. No, if you find something that works for you, that makes you feel good, then that's awesome. And I'm not gonna try and give you medical advice, I can't but just don't take something because you think you're supposed to or because you're under the impression that surely a plant can't harm you. Cyanide is natural, arsenic is natural. That doesn't mean you're going to take an arsenic pill every morning, right? I just think it's worth knowing how unregulated these things are and how dangerous they can be when taken improperly. Read the warning labels, talk to your doctor, and do some research before you commit to a pill, any pill even if it's just some fancy plant pill that doesn't seem like it can hurt you. Supplements are not regulated and until they are, it's up to the consumer to be informed because the government is not on your side. So with all of that being said, please be safe about whatever vitamins or supplements you might be consuming and consider if they actually work in the first place because seriously, the amount that don't is pretty astounding. If you enjoyed today's episode of The Corporate Casket, make sure you are liking, following, and subscribing so you can always stay updated the second a new episode comes live. And if you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to the description box and click on my Linktree link. It will have all of my links for all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. Thank you so much for making it to another Corporate Casket. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.